All right, hey everybody. Welcome back to the brewery. My name's Adam. This is the beautiful Cartridge Brewing. Today we are brewing the most difficult beer that I have to make. I think a lot of times American light lager gets a bad rap. How I prefer to describe it is in the words of the great Charlie Bamforth, which it is a gently flavored lager. We make a light lager here called Cartucho, and it's a Mexican style lager. When I go into a brewery, I get the lightest thing that they make. And it's not because it's what I'm necessarily most interested in drinking personally, but from kind of an academic standpoint, it is. The lightest beer that a brewery makes really shows the skill of the brew house. There's nothing to hide behind. If there's any flaws, any off flavors, they're definitely coming through. For us, Cartucho is probably our number one seller. We put this beer on, it's light, crisp, and refreshing. It's an adjunct lager, meaning that uh, in this particular case, we use about 20% rice with it. It's light, easy drinking, we serve it with a lime. It really is one of the more demanding beers that we have to make here from a quality standpoint. And we'll kind of explain that throughout the brew day today. Uh, we're gonna get jumping on it. I'm looking forward to it, and we're gonna make some beer. All right, so we're getting ready to mash in. We're gonna be taking water from the hot liquor tank down below the mash tun, pumping it up into the grist hydrator, which is attached to the top of the mash tun. And I'll be dropping the grain and pushing the hot water from the hot liquor tank, dropping them into the mash tun. I track that water going through my flow meter. And here we go. 6.33. Yes, I'm recording. We're starting to get into our busier season here at Cartridge. Demand's pumping up. We're starting to get cans out, different things like that, which is new for us. So we're having a big production spike. Generally, my stress response to that is showing up early. Uh, my staff usually gets in around seven. Today, I was in at six. It just, I just like it. I feel like I get ahead on some things and there's just something to brewing in a quiet brewery. Nobody else is here. It's dark outside. It's pretty good. One of the nice things about it is there's nothing else going on. You can be really mindful of what's going on around you, how all your equipment is working, everything like that. I track all times, volumes, and everything like that on a brew log. That's something that I'll make available through either a website or in a link down below, something like that. You might have a brew log that's better for you. You might not have a brew log at all. If mine's useful, that's awesome. It's a pretty straightforward recipe that we're brewing today when it comes to Cartucho. Uh, it's a really 50-50 split between domestic Pilsner and domestic two-row. And then it's about 20% flake rice. 13 IBU or bitterness units. Uh, in the kettle, all at 60. We try to make sure that we hit our pHs right. We get the water profile appropriate for what we want to be doing because it's all going to show in a beer like this. That's kind of what makes this beer style so demanding to brew. All right, so we're dropping grain right now, mixing with that hot water from the hot liquor tank through the grist hydrator right here. The grain's dropping down through this flexible tubing right here. I was talking to a brewer buddy of mine. His name's Andy. He's down at Linwood Brewing Concern. Shout out to Andy and to Beal. I was talking to him about the recipe and he asked why I was using some domestic uh, two-row and Pilsner in this. I've made this beer a lot of different ways, but when you are talking about gently flavored beers, you really have to try to pick your spots. One of the reasons that I have this split between two row and pills is I'm trying to create a little bit of space between that and my Munich Hellas. My Munich Hellas is primarily Barca Pilsner from Weyermann. And so you can say, well, there's gonna be a huge difference between that and using domestic pills, different things like that. And there is, but sometimes you can make them, sometimes they can just be a little too close so I'm trying to create some elbow room between those two beers. They're both fermented with the same lager strain, which is Harvest from Imperial, who we absolutely love. Killer, uh, killer yeast, killer customer service. And so something else that I do to create a little space between my German Hellas called Up the Hill and Cartucho, our Mexican lager, is I flip-flop the water profile a little bit. 
And what that means is I do want to be hitting a similar pH range across the board on those two beers, so it's not really that. But rather, up the hill, our municalis is a lot higher in chloride, which chloride helps to make a beer a little bit more soft and a little bit more round. This beer, I have a little bit more uh, sulfate in it, meaning that it's gonna come across as a little bit more crisp. Uh, the bitterness might be a bit more in focus, even though the beer is not a bitter beer. I like to think about gypsum. Sometimes people say it emphasizes bitterness. That makes it sound like it magnifies it, really. I think what it does more effectively in my mind, if you grab a pair of binoculars and it's fuzzy looking through the lenses, you can use that focus dial and that focus dial will help to brighten up, to crisp up the image. And I think that's what elevating your gypsum level does for bitterness. So you're seeing me add both small amounts of food grade phosphoric acid. That's to bring the pH into the range that we wanna see for this beer and then small amounts of gypsum and uh, calcium chloride. So this whole process of mashing in is really just about getting a really homogenous mixture of this grain, of this malt that is dropping down through this flexible line right here into the top of the grist hydrator and blending it with hot water from the hot liquor tank and then dropping it into the mash tun and mixing that all up. We got 303 gallons of strike water coming in. Strike water is just what we call the hot liquor tank water that is coming in and making the initial uh, mash mixture. Sometimes when people discuss lager, they want to talk about it like it's kind of a whole different thing from making an ale. I'm not really in that space on that. My personal thought is, yes, when you're making a lager, you really, you really want to be on point. You want your water chemistry correct. Everything's going to show. Lager yeast does not bring a lot to the table as far as flavors and aromas. It just really lets your process, the malt and the hop shine through. So if there's cracks in your process, poor ingredients, something along those lines, poor process down, downstream, then it's gonna come back to bite you. So when we brew lager, there's nothing different than we do than when we brew our ales. We try to make sure our water's on point, our process is on point, our yeast health is right, appropriate pitching rate, all that stuff for yeast. So that's really kind of it. We're about two thirds of the way through our mash right now. Everything is looking great. We are periodically adding our salt and acid Life is good. I'm a really big believer in being as prepared as possible at the beginning of your brew day. Um, this can seem like a lot of standing around at this point, just kind of monitoring the mash. If I'm running around and have a lot of other things to do, I'm asking to make mistakes. I'm asking to hurt myself. Uh, floors can be slippery. There's hoses that lay on the floor. Trip and fall is very big in a brewery, so, you know. The more prepared you are, generally the safer your work environment is, and that's obviously number one. Over the past year, year, uh, year and a half, I've been training up brewery staff that is completely new to the industry, and so trying to get those good practices, preparation, all that stuff is a really big part of what we're doing. Oh, there's the end of the grain. I'm gonna chase thrust that grain through here. Close that up. I still got some water to come in behind the grain now, even though the grain is done uh, dropping through the hydrator. Typically, the beers that we make, I use a mash to grain ratio or a mash to grist ratio of 1.5 quarts per pound. For this beer, because there's so little grain in here, I just like going two quarts per pound. Just about to wrap up this mash. We've run a lot of different base malts uh, in this brewery over the past year. But right now we just switched to a contract with Malt Europe. We've been really pleased with the product thus far. Um, but again, this is like the real test for a malt like this, right? Where there's just nothing to hide behind you know, and kind of building off this idea that, yeah, I mean, this is, if some warts are gonna show in your process, in your ingredients, they're gonna show in a beer like this.
I like to reverse the rake. I don't know why it makes me comfortable. I like the idea of mixing in both directions. And then I will run the rake forward again. That is one of just my weird little personal preference things. It might not do anything, but it makes me more comfortable. And I don't believe as if it can hurt anything. So that's what I'm doing. I will run it forward again. Um, just based off my mindset of if those rakes are designed to leave that grain in a certain state, I'm going to run it the direction that it was intended to be run ultimately. So get a couple more rotations off the rake and we are done with the mash in for cartucho. All right, so now we have cartucho, our Mexican lager in the mash tun and we're fully mashed in. And the next step for our process is to get this wort recirculating after a rest period. Uh, so we've really had the extent of our rest. And to be honest, I don't do long mash rests anymore. When I was home brewing, I would rest this mash for a full hour. Uh, it's my understanding and my experience to see that this grain converts very, very quickly these days. What's going on in the mash ton is when hot water and malt are mixed within a certain temperature range, the starch within the malt is converted to sugar. That malt sugar water is now referred to as wort. What I'm gonna start doing is I'm gonna start recirculating the wort in the mash tun. The mash tun has a false bottom or a screen on the bottom where I can start to draw that cloudy wort, that wort that's kind of full of grain particulate and everything, pull that off the underneath that and then pump it back up and put it back on top of the mash bed. What that recirculation does is it helps clarify the work, uh, meaning obviously make it clear, but also make it free from particulate. So anyways, I'm gonna get that started. Uh, this is our uh, runoff valve. It's a dial valve. You'll see usually butterfly valves in our brewery, but this dial valve is specifically meant to be a real fine touch valve that you can make real fine point adjustments with. We're going to start running what is kind of this real white, cloudy, milky looking wort out of here right now. It's going to go into our good friend Ulysses S. Grant here. What the Grant is, it's just a secondary vessel that's going to hold wort. And then what is attached to the Grant is a pump. I don't want to be pumping directly off the mash bed because it has that screen on the bottom. And if I pump too hard, I can compress that grain bed and I don't want to do that. I want that grain bed to stay relatively loose and easy to flow liquid through. So a grant is an intermediary vessel that will hold wort and I can pump off this. I can run this dry and it's not a huge deal. I can kind of pump too hard on this. I, I don't try to, but this prevents me from, the grant helps to prevent me from collapsing the grain bed. So anyways, this is gonna fill up and then we're gonna start the research. All right, everybody, we are through the mash. Uh, we are through the research. Uh, the wort has cleared up quite a bit, looking nice and happy. Uh, where we're at right now is we are into the louder, which meaning uh, we are running wort from the mash tun into the kettle. Uh, let me show you. Steamy kettle running. Once I run a couple of barrels into the kettle, we're gonna begin sparging the mash tun. There's like six different spray heads inside of my mash tun, and we're gonna spray that hot water on top of the grain bed, and we're gonna to continue to rinse the sugar out of it. It's really important, especially on these light lagers. Um, this is what makes a beer like Mexican lager kind of so demanding to make, is making sure that you're hitting all of your pH numbers. If you're gonna get kind of a grainy husky character, um, because of high pH water, it's really gonna show in a beer like this. So I'm gonna be tracking that. I'm gonna go prep up those, uh, the acid and salts for the sparge. And at that point, we will both be loudering, which is moving wort from the mash tun to the kettle, and we're going to be sparging. We are now sparging cartucho, and all sparging means is that we're taking hot water from the hot liquor tank and spraying it over the surface of the mash bed. That's gonna help us to continue to rinse sugar out from the malt and run it into the kettle. We run a 15 barrel brew house. 
which means that we're going to have to get about 18 barrels into the kettle in order to have a finished 15 barrels of beer when all of our processes are done. You can use any of that. All right, there's the sparge, and then over here, we have the kettle filling up. All right, so we have kettle full with this batch of cartucho. Things have gone really smoothly. We monitored our pH all the way through. We're hitting all the numbers that we want to be hitting. The original gravity on this beer is around 1034. It's gonna come up to about 10.39. The really small beer finishes, at, finishes out at 4.3 ABV. So it's 4.3% ABV. It goes from 10.39 OG down to like 10.06, so nice and dry. We have 18 barrels in the kettle. I'm hoping you can see something from that. Our mash tun is gonna be dry at this point. There's gonna be a little more water at the bottom, a little bit more wort at the bottom but we're gonna get rid of that June dry grain bed right there. The kettle is full and starting to turn over. We're still coming up to a boil though. I'm gonna start dropping uh, the remainder of the wort out of the mash tun. Uh, as I kind of monitor the kettle coming up to a boil, we're gonna grain out and we'll keep moving. All right, so we are brewing Cartucho, our Mexican lager, and we are just about to do our first but only hop edition for this beer. Uh, a beer like American Light Lager uh, or Mexican Lager, I'm kind of smushing them together. There's a lot of similarity, but it doesn't need a lot of bitterness in order to balance this beer out. Functionally, that's what bitterness is doing. Bitterness is providing a balance to the amount of sweetness in a beer. There's not a ton of sweetness in this beer. It's a dry beer. And so we don't need a lot of bitterness in order to balance it. There's only 13 IBU in this beer. And we're gonna get that out of one edition of Magnum Hops. Typically, for a bittering edition like this, I use a hop like Warrior or Magnum. They're both what are kind of referred to as high alpha acid clean bittering hops. High alpha acid just means that they have the potential to contribute a, a lot of bitterness. In this case, I'm using a hop like this because I don't need a lot of hop volume in the kettle to get the, the small amount of bitterness that I need. and it's gonna help give me more wort on the back end. The more hops that I add to this, the more, the more wort they suck up. So it actually gives me a little more uh, finished beer if I don't use large volumes of hops in the kettle. But this small addition of hops is, me, is going to give me about 13 IBU, which will be just enough to keep this beer um, easy drinking and crisp. And you might ask why I'm not dumping these hops in all at once. Sometimes when you add hops to a rolling kettle like this, it'll make it want to foam up and boil over. It is one of the more dangerous things that can happen in a brewery. And so I take my time with it. I usually add my hops over the course of a minute or two. Uh, if some of you are pro brewers that are watching this and they're screaming because you feel like I should be adding them thicker, that's cool. Um, I don't want it to boil over. So that's why I do it. I have two minutes in my day in order to get that done safely. So anyways, 
Um, that's the deal. These hops are gonna boil for 60 minutes, generating the 13 IBU that we need for this beer. You will also see me add yeast nutrient and uh, a product called Worldfly, and we'll discuss what they do as we go. All right, we'll see you in 45 minutes. It's been 45 minutes since our 60 minute hop edition. The 60 minute hop edition just means that we're boiling those hops for 60 minutes. Anyways, there's 15 minutes left in the boil and we are going to add our yeast nutrient. There's some thoughts both ways on yeast nutrient. Um, obviously the idea behind yeast nutrient is to have appropriate nutrients for your yeast. People will say if you're using an all malt grist or if all the grain you're using for your beer is malt, then the only thing you need for yeast health is zinc. I use a product called Servomyces, um, which is essentially a zinc-infused yeast nutrient. We'll, we'll just say it like that. Because as we said, yeast does need zinc. There's some research out there that says that the supermajority of that nutrient is gonna be lost in the, in the kettle. That'll get caught in some of the true, some of the protein and other solids in the bottom of the kettle. We'll see. Uh, I'm still doing my work on it uh, as far as research goes. There's a lot that <laughs> is to learn with brewing and there's a lot left, left to be learned, even, even by researchers. So um, this is what we do. We use yeast nutrient at 15 minutes. Uh, and five minutes left in the boil, we're going to be adding our whirl flock. And then we're going to be whirlpooling it and getting ready to be sending it to the fermenter. All right, we've got about five minutes left in the boil. And what I add for all of my beers is I add a product called whirl flock. There's two worlds in there. Whirl as in whirlpool and flock as in flocculation. Flocculation just means gathering together, sticking together, basically. What this product is meant to do, it's, it's a, basically a, a clarifier and meaning that it's gonna help me get a clearer wort out of the kettle. All the little bits of what we call true protein, grain particulate, this is gonna help them stick together, be heavier, and then fall out of solution so we can harvest that, that clear wort out of the kettle. Boom, boom, next is Whirlpool. All right, that's our timer on the brew day here. So what we're going to do is we're going to stop that timer. I'm going to shut down the steam, cutting off the kettle, and then we are going to begin whirlpooling it. Whirlpooling is just like what it sounds like. I'm running the beer through a pump around the outer edge of the kettle, and it's creating a slight vortex. I keep the kettle doors open long enough to make sure that everything's working, that I'm getting that rotation started. And then I will spin that for five minutes to get the whole contents moving. I'll turn off the kettle, and that's my Whirlpool rest. Um, that'll last for 20 minutes. That will let all the protein, tube, and everything like that settle out into a cone at the bottom of the kettle, giving me the ability to run all that clean wort off, that clear wort off, through the heat exchanger, cooling it off to a fermenter. Today, this is a 30 barrel batch that we're doing. So we already have our yeast in the fermenter. This is the back half of it. This is the second day of that brew day. We have a 15 barrel system. So uh, we'll be getting our really 32 barrels into that fermenter. That's it for now. All right, so our whirlpool rest is done, meaning all the solids that are gonna settle out in this, in this wort are settled out down in the bottom and kind of, kind of coned up in the bottom so we can draw all that clear wort off. What we're doing right now is we're taking that wort, we're going through the heat exchanger where we're sending cold water through. It heats that water and returns it to our hot liquor tank. And then the wort is now cold and we're sending that to the fermenter. What we have going on here is we're knocking this beer out in the low 50s, 50, 52 degrees. And we're gonna let fermentation run there with it. And it's running through, going through this loop of hose, running into this tank right here, boom. Displacing all of that headspace in the fermenter. 
And we're gonna rip that thing at 50 degrees and get all those sugars eaten, and turned into alcohol and make that beer. But this is, this is kind of it. All right, all right, all right. Okay, so let's try Cartucho, our Mexican lager. And this is kind of the, the payoff after this brew day, right? Once again, it's a challenging style because there's not a lot to hide behind. At the same time, it's also not the most exciting beer that you can drink. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's, it's good hot weather beer, stuff like that. Here in house, we serve it uh, with a lime. I think it works like that. In my mind, I just think of it's, I don't know, it's light, easy, refreshing. So anyways, let's check it out. We'll do some tasting notes. Decent little pour. All right, so, um, as with a lot of these beers, I mean, it's not, it's not the most, it doesn't blow out of the glass. It doesn't have huge aromas, flavors, everything like that. But it is crisp, super easy drinking. With the lime in there, it throws a little acidity at it. A little bit of that tart citrus character brightens it up even more. Um, super accessible, man. Uh, and, and again, we just sell a bunch of it. We're using Harvest Lager Strain from Imperial Yeast for this beer. We really, for all of our lagers. It, it, it's a strain that I, that I really like a lot. I think it's pretty versatile. One of the things that we've done with this beer in particular, and partially to, again, create a little bit more space between some of our more traditional German lagers and this, we have done a little bit of a progressive fermentation uh, profile with this where we will pitch cold and then set the temperature jacket higher um, like this batch uh, in particular was uh, pitched at 50 with uh, a typical lager volume of yeast thrown at it uh, and then the jacket was set to 65 and it free rises and finishes out there on top of the fact that obviously that fermentation will happen a little bit more quickly I actually find the fermentation profile to be a little bit more domestic lager like a little Bud Miller Coors like and you know you can hate that or not or whatever um, but this is kind of that where I mean we're in that style of beer right so anyways um, we've done a lot with this beer um, tried out different things but the key I do believe one of the keys with making light lager as we mentioned during the brew day is keeping our pH within range on this. When you have a beer that's this gently flavored and you get your pH out of whack, you're gonna get a lot of like, a lot of graininess and a lot of huskiness from that potentially sparge water that has a high, too high of a pH. Um, but anyhow, it's easy drinking, um, cold with a lime in it or not, it works out good. So anyways, cheers.